Live from Copenhagen, Denmark, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon Europe 2018. Brought to you by the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and its ecosystem partners. Hello everyone, welcome back. This is theCUBE's exclusive coverage of the Linux Foundation's Cloud Native Compute Foundation, KubeCon 2018 in Europe. I'm John Furrier, co-host of theCUBE, and we're here with two Google folks, uh, J.D. Velasquez, who's the PM, product manager for Stackdriver, got some news on that we're going to cover, and David Aronchek, who's the co-founder of Kubeflow, also with Google, uh, news here on that. Guys, welcome uh, to theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks so we're going to have Google Next coming up. The Cube will be there this summer. Looking forward to digging into all the um, enterprise traction you guys have and we had some good briefings at, at Google. Ton of movement on the cloud for Google, so congratulations. Um, Thank you. Open source is not new to Google. This is a big show for you guys. What's the focus? You've got some news on, on Stackdriver and Kubeflow. Kubeflow, not Kubeflow, that's our, our flow. <laughs> <laughs> David, share some of the news and then we'll get into the stack driver. Absolutely, so uh, Kubeflow is a brand new project. Uh, we launched it in December and it is uh, basically how to make machine learning stacks easy to use and deploy and maintain uh, on Kubernetes. So uh, we're not launching anything new, we, we support TensorFlow and PyTorch, CAFE, uh, all the tools that you're familiar with today, but we use all the native APIs and constructs that Kubernetes provides to make it very easy and to let data scientists and researchers focus on what they do great and let the IT ops people uh, deploy and manage these stacks. So simplifying the interactions and cross-functionality of the apps using it, Kubernetes. Exactly, when you go and talk to any researcher out there or data scientist, what you'll find is, is that while the model, TensorFlow or PyTorch yeah. or whatever, that gets a little bit of the attention, 95% of the time is spent in all the other elements of the pipeline. Transforming your data, ingesting it, experimenting, visualizing, and then rolling it out to our production. What we want to do with Kubeflow is give everyone a standard way to interact with those, uh, to interact with all those components, and give them a great workflow for doing so. That's great. And the stack driver news, what's the news we got going on? Uh, we're Jake? excited, we just announced uh, the beta release of uh, stack driver Kubernetes monitoring, which provides very rich and comprehensive observability for Kubernetes. So this is essentially simplifying operations for developers and operators. It's a, a, a very cool solution. It integrates uh, many signals across your Kubernetes environment, including metrics, logs, uh, events, as well as metadata. And so what it allows uh, uh, is for you to really inspect your Kubernetes environment, regardless of the role and re regardless of where your deployment uh, is running it. I mean, David's bringing up just the use cases. I'm just, my, my mind's exploding, because you think about what TensorFlow is to a developer and all the, the goodness that's going on with the app layer. The monitoring and the instrumentation is a critical piece because what Kubernetes is going to bring to people is <laughs> thousands and thousands of new services. So how do you instrument that? I mean, you got to know, I'm going to provision a service dynamically that didn't exist. Right. How do you measure that? I mean, this is, is this the challenge you guys are trying to figure out here? Yeah, for, for sure, John. And, and uh, the uh, great thing here is that we, we and at Google, uh, primarily many of our SRE practices go beyond monitoring. It really is about observability, which I would describe more as a, you know, as a property of, of, of a system. How do yeah. you uh, uh, are able to collect all these many signals to help you diagnose the production failure and to get information about usage and so mm. forth. So we, we do all of that yeah. for you in your Kubernetes environment, right? We take that toil away from the developer or the operator. Now, a cool thing is that you can also instrument your application uh, in open source. You can use Prometheus, and we have an integration for that. So anything you've done in a, in a Prometheus instrumentation, now you can bring into the cloud uh, as needed. Talk about this notion, because everyone gets like, oh my God, Google's huge. You guys are very open, you're integrating well. Talk about the uh, guiding principles you guys have when you think about Prometheus as an example, integrating in with these other projects. How are you guys treating these other projects? What's the standard practice? API base, is there integration plans? How do you guys address that question? Yeah, so at a high level, I would say, you know, at Google, we really believe in, in the uh, contributing and, and helping grow open communities. I think that the, the best way to maintain a, a community open and portable is to help it grow. And, and Prometheus, uh, particularly, uh, and Kubernetes, of course, is a very vibrant community in that sense. So we are, you know, from the start, we uh, design our yeah. systems to be able to have integration via APIs and so on, but also contributing directly to the projects. And, and I think that one thing that's just leveraging off that exact point, um, you know, we realize what the world looks like. There's literally, you know, zero customers out there who are like, well, I want to be all in on one cloud. Uh, you know, that $25 right. million dollar data center I spent last year building, yeah, I'll toss that out so that I can get, you know, some special thing. 
The reality is people are multi-cloud, and the only way to solve any problem is with these very open standards that work wherever yeah. people are, and that's very much core to our philosophy. Well, I mean, I've been critical of multi-cloud by the definition. I mean, statistically, if I'm on Azure with 365, that's Azure. If I'm running something on Amazon, those are two clouds. Mm. They're not multi-cloud by my definition, which brings up where this is going, which is latency and portability, which you guys are really behind. Um, how are you guys looking at that? Because you mentioned observation. Let's talk about the observation space of clouds. How are you guys looking at, because that's what people are, are talking about. When are we going to get to the future state, which is I need to have workload portability in real time. If I want to move something from Azure to AWS or Google Cloud, that would be, would be cool. <laughs> Can so we do that today? <laughs> that is actually the core of what we did around Kubeflow. What we are able to do is describe in code all the layers of your pipeline, all the steps of your pipeline that works based on any conformant Kubernetes cluster. So you have a Kubernetes conformant cluster on Azure, or on AWS, or on Google Cloud, or on your laptop, or on your private data center, that's great. And, and to be clear, I totally agree. I don't think having single workloads spread across cloud, that's not just not realistic, because of all the things you identify. Latency, yeah. uh, variability, unknown failures, you know, uh, cap theorem is a thing because yeah. you know, it, it's well known. The, what people want to do is they want to take advantage of different clouds for the, the efforts that they provide. Maybe my data is here, maybe I have a legal reason, uh, maybe this particular cloud has a unique chip or unique uh, Use cases ser service. can drive it, yeah. Exactly, and then I can take a, uh, my workload which has been described in code and deploy it to that place where it makes sense keeping it within a single cloud, but as an organization, I'll use mul multiple clouds together. Yeah, and I agree, and the data is key because if you can have data moving between clouds, I think that's something that I would like to see because that's going to be, the metadata you mentioned is a real critical piece of all these apps, mm -hmm. whether it's instrumentation, logging, and or you know, provisioning you know, new services. Yeah, Absolutely. and as soon as you have that, as, as David is mentioning, if you have deployments on you know, multiple public or private clouds, then the, the difficult part is that observability that we were talking before. Because now you're trying to stitch together data and, and tools to help you, you know, get that diagnostic uh, signals yeah. when you need them. This is what we're doing with Stackdriver Kubernetes Monitoring precisely. You know, uh, we're early days in the cloud, it still feels like we're 10 years in, but you know, a lot of people are, are now coming to realize cloud native. So, you know, I'm not a big fan of the whole, you know, Amazon, although this Amazon's winning, they are doing quite well with the cloud because they're a cloud. It's early days, and you, just, you guys are doing some really specific good things with the cloud, but you don't have the breadth of services, say, Amazon has, and you guys are above board about that. You're like, hey, we're not trying to meet them speed, speed on services, but you're doing certain things really, really well. You mentioned SRE, uh, Site Reliability Engineers. This is a scale best practice that you guys have bringing to the table, but yet the customers are learning about Kubernetes. Some people have never heard of it before, say, hey, what's this Kubernetes thing? Right. What is your perspectives on the relevance of Kubernetes at this point in history? Because it, it really feels like a critical mass, de facto standard movement where everyone's getting behind Kubernetes for all the right reasons. It feels a lot like interoperability is <laughs> here. Thoughts on Kubernetes relevance? Well, I think that um, uh, Alexis Richardson summed it up uh, great today, the, the uh, uh, chairperson of the, the Technical Oversight Committee. Um, the reality is, is that what we're looking for, what, what operators and software engineers have been looking for forever is clean lines between the various concerns. And so, um, as you think about the underlying infrastructure and then you think about the applications that run on top of that, uh, potentially services that run on top of that, then you think about applications, then you think about how that shows up to end users. To, uh, you know, before, if you're old like me, you remember that you'd buy a $50,000 machine and stick it in the corner and you'd stack everything on there, right? That never works, right? The power supply goes out, the memory goes out, this particular database goes out. Yes. Failure will happen. The only way to actually build a system that is reliable, that can meet your business needs, is by adopting something more cloud native, where if any particular component fails, um, your system can recover. If you have business requirements that change, you can move very quickly and adapt. Um, Kubernetes provides a rich, um, a portable, common set of APIs that do work everywhere. And as a result, you're starting to see a lot of adoption because it gives people that opportunity. But I think, you know, and let me hand off to JD here, 
you know, the next layer up is about observability because without yeah. ob observing what's going on in each of those stacks, um, you're not going to have any kind of Well, programmability comes behind it, to your point. Talk about that, that's a huge point. Yeah, and, and just to build a, uh, on what David is saying, you know, well, the thing that is unique about Google is that we've been doing for more than a, a decade now, we've been very good at, at uh, being able to provide uh, innovative services without compromising yeah. reliability, right? And so what we're doing is in that commitment, and you see that with uh, Kubernetes and Istio, we're externalizing many of our you know, opinionated infrastructure and mm -hmm. platforms in that sense, but it's not just the platforms. You need those methodologies and best practices, and now the tool set. So that's what yeah. we're doing now, precisely. And There's you guys have made great strides, just to kind of point out to the folks watching in the enterprise. I know you got a lot more work to do, but you're pedaling as fast as you can. I want to ask you specifically around this, because we're, again, we're still early days in the cloud, if you think about it. There are now table stakes that are on the table that you got to get done, check boxes, if you will. Certainly on, on the government side, there's like compliance issues, and you guys are now checking those boxes. What is the key thing? Because you guys are operating at a scale that I think enterprises can't even fathom. Mm -hmm. I mean, millions of services going on at huge scale. That's going to be helpful for them down the road, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. But today, what is the Google table stakes that are done? And what are enterprises need to have for table stakes to do cloud native right from your perspective? Well, I think more than anything, um, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. The reality is all the hyperscale cloud providers have the same table stakes, all the check boxes are checked, we're ready to go. Uh, I think what will really differentiate and move the ball forward for so many people is this adoption of cloud native. And really, how cloud native is your cloud, right? How much do you need to spin up an, an entire SRE team like Netflix in order to operate in the Netflix model of you know, complete um, automation and building your own services and things like that. Does your cloud help you get cloud native? And I think that's where we, we really want to lean in. It's not about IaaS anymore, it's about does your cloud support the reliability, support the um, distribution, all the various services in order to help you move even faster and achieve higher velocity? And standing up that is critical because now these applications are the business model of companies when you talk about digital. So I tweeted, I want to get your reaction to this yesterday. I got a quote I, I overheard from a person here in the hallways. I need to get away from VPNs and firewalls. I need user application layer security with unfishable access, otherwise I'm never safe. Again, this talks about the perimeterless cloud, Spear phishing is really hot right now. You get people getting killed with security concerns. So I'm going to stop if I'm an enterprise. I'm going to say, hold on, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to proceed with caution. What are you guys doing to, to take away the, the fear and also the reality that as you provision all these, stand up all these infrastructure services for customers, what are you guys doing to prevent phishing attacks from happening, security concerns, what's the Google story? Uh, I, so I think that, that um, uh, more than anything, what we're trying to do is exactly what JD just said, which is externalize right. all the practices that we have. So, for example, um, you know, in, in, at Google we have all sorts of internal tools that we've used and internal practices. For example, um, uh, we, have, we just published a white paper uh, about uh, our security practices where you need to have two vulnerabilities in order to break out of any system. We have all that uh, written up there. We just published a white paper about uh, encryption and how to do encryption by default, encryption between machines and so on. Uh, but I think what we're really doing is we're helping people to operate like Google without having to spin up an entire SRE team as big as Google's to do it. And an example is, uh, we just released something internally, we have something called Beyond Corp. It's a non-firewall, non-VPN based way for you to authenticate against any Google system uh, using two-factor authentication uh, for our internal employees. Externally, we just released it, it's called uh, Internet, uh, excuse me, Identity Aware Proxy. Uh, you can use it with literally any service that you have. Uh, you can provision a domain name, you can uh, integrate with uh, OAuth, you can, yeah. uh, including Google OAuth or your own private OAuth, all those various things. That's that's simply a service that we offer. And so, really, you know, I, I think- And the there's also multi multi more than two-factor coming down the road, right? Exactly. Well, actually, uh, Identity Aware Proxy already supports two-factor. But I will say, um, uh, one of the things that, that uh, I always tell people <clears throat> is uh, a lot of enterprises say exactly what you said geez, this, this new world looks very scary to me, I'm going to slow down. The problem is, is they're, they're mistaken, under the mistaken impression that they're secure today. More, more than likely, yeah. they're not. They already have firewall, they already have VPN, and it's not great. Uh, in many ways, the, the enterprises that are going to win are the ones that yeah. lean in and move faster yeah. to the new world where... Well, they uh, have to, otherwise yeah. they're going to die. With IoT and all these benefits, they're exposed even as they are, just operationally, yep. just to support it. Okay, I want to get your thoughts, guys, on um, Google's role here at the Linux Foundation CNCF KubeCon event. 
Um, you guys do a lot of work in open source. You got a lot of great fan base. I'm, I'm a fan of what you guys do. Love, love the tech Google brings to the table. How do people get involved? What are you guys connecting with here? What's going on at the show? And how does someone get on board with the Google train? Certainly the TensorFlow has been, it's like uh, you know, great, great open source goodness. Developers are loving it. What's going on? Well, we have uh, uh, over almost uh, 200 uh, people from Google here at, at the show uh, uh, helping and connecting with people. We have a, a Google booth, uh, which I invite people to stop by and, and talk about the different pro projects we have. Um, yeah, um, and, and exactly like you said, uh, there are, we have an entire repo on GitHub. Uh, anyone can jump in. All our things are open source and available yeah. for everyone to use, uh, no matter where they are. Um, obviously, <clears throat> I've been on Kubernetes for a while. Uh, uh, the Kubernetes project is on fire. TensorFlow is on fire. Yeah. Kubeflow that we mentioned earlier is completely open source. We're yeah. integrated with Prometheus, which is a CNCF project. Uh, we we are huge fans yeah. of the these open source foundations, and we think that's the direction that that um, most software projects. Well, congratulations! Go. I know you guys invest a lot. Just want to highlight that. And again, to show my age, you know, these younger generations have no idea how hard open source was in the early days. I call it open bar at open source. <laughs> you guys are bringing so much. You know, everyone's drunk on all this goodness, you know, just these libraries you guys are bringing to the table. Right. I mean, TensorFlow is just the, the classic poster child example. I mean, you're bringing a lot of stuff to the table. I mean, you invented Kubernetes, just so much good stuff coming in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I hesitate to say we invented it. It really was a community effort, yeah. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Well, you opened we it up and you did it right and did a good job. Mm. Congratulations. Thank Thanks for coming on theCUBE. I'm going to see you at Google Next. The Cube will be uh, broadcasting live at Google Next in July. Of course, we'll do a big drill down on, on Google Cloud Platform at that show. It's the Cube here at KubeCon 2018 in Copenhagen, Denmark. More live coverage after this short break. Stay with us. Ah!